Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Scott Howell, and I'm the chairman, excuse me, of the Pioneer Park Coalition. And uh, to start off today, we, uh, at the Doug Wright Show this morning, there was a question that they put up, is what Utah is doing today is working for homelessness. We'd encourage everyone to take a minute to text to 801-575-7755. And one is yes, and two is no, and we'll kind of keep track, and we're going to have an interactive uh, technology today on some of the questions. So first of all, welcome. Welcome to the Coalition Town Hall meeting. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. It's really important. We have such an eclectic crowd here. Last night, about, I don't know, 11.30, Something came on their Facebook, and they uh, was a group to organize a protest. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I've never been protested before, and I served in the state legislature for a long time. I ran against Lauren Hatch, and uh, that didn't work out too well. Uh, so I think and I'm probably out of my zone here. Um, so I thought about it this morning, and I thought. Uh, we should invite the protesters to be here with us. I am all about transparency, fact versus fiction. And to all the protesters who are here, thank you for coming in. Jennifer, where are you? Right here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming in and joining us today. So we, we have an action-packed uh, uh, agenda, and we're going to give t time to everyone to have input. We want to hear from you. The coalition is focused on three things. One, accountability. Two, responsibility. Three, safety and security for our brothers and sisters. Not homeless. They're just out of their uh, 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 a shelter right now. But that's what we want to do. We want to make it better for them. Uh, to start off today, we have uh, a video. and. This is in the context of someone who's been uh, in a medical situation, but I'd ask you to keep in your mind that person that you see on the street, how do we figure out what's going on with them? I always equate it to this. Sometimes I see people and I go, oh, you are just one of those rich Mormon guys. Or I'll say, yeah, wrong. Or I'll say, oh, you are one of those people that or you do this. And I never really take the full benefit of understanding the rest of the puzzle. I remember one time at work, there was an individual that was just so disgruntled and so mean. Well, I didn't find out till much later on that she had cancer, and she wasn't happy at that time. And I think we may have preconceived notions about people we see. So we're gonna show this video to start off with, and then we'll go from there. If we'll go ahead and roll it, so. And if you guys want to turn down the light in the back, that would be great.
So it, uh, it hopefully causes all of us to think a little bit about Cleveland Clinic opened its doors in March 1921. We're OK with that. I sit on the board of directors for a little health uh, organization in Northern California called Sutter Health. It's kind of the equivalent of IHC here in, in Utah. And we are going through major transformation down there. And when we, uh, at our last meeting, they showed this clip. And the only thing I could think about was our homeless brothers and sisters and really putting them in that position. Because you just never know what the situation is. But we're still a family. So today, we have um, a start off our coalition, first of all, is one of our original founders. A lot of people have asked me, Scott, what has the coalition really accomplished? What have you guys done? Where are you? Well, we want to share with you what we've done in just less than almost 12 months, I guess it's been. So Forrest McNabb from Big D Construction, one of the original founders, is going to take a few minutes, update us on that, and then we'll move right on. Thank you, Thank you Scott. And I am going to protest because I'm not eclectic, okay? <laughs> so folks, every now and then we come across the crossroads and we have to make decisions whether we're going to tolerate the status quo or make a difference. When we bought our building in 2003, we moved into it in 2004, the administration talked about changes that they were making the neighborhood, helped clean it up. I think throughout those discussions, never once did the word relocating the homeless and the service providers enter in that conversation. It was just, how are we going to clean up this area? There's a lot of people who have been on several different committees throughout the years in that neighborhood to try to make a difference. Nice job, Bill. That better? They have tried to make a difference. It wasn't working. Those committees have just made in the sunset. We get frustrated. Guess what? It is what it is. Before I tell you where our story started as a coalition, it's $5 fine, Scott, for your phone ring. Is I often put myself in shoes. What would Jesus do? What would you be in that situation if that happened to me, anybody in my family? People don't volunteer and say, hey, I want to be homeless. It's not a choice thing. And so throughout our conversations, that's never been the topic. How do we get rid of them? How do we move them out of the neighborhood? How do we do that? I will tell you the topic started about July, August of 2013, summer concert series. For some reason, 2013 turned into just a fiasco. I get to work a little before 6 every morning, and I'm greeted by piles of feces on the employee entrance. I'm greeted by piles of vomit on our sidewalk. We leave at night, after 6 o'clock at night, there's an OT in our parking lot. Here's fire trucks. There's several police cars. We're going, are you kidding me? Where do we live? What have we created here? So I started reaching out to the city. Well, we'll send somebody out to clean it up. And I said, what time? 10 o'clock when our employees are already here? Well, you don't need to clean that up. Well, who else is going to clean it up? Meanwhile, the efforts were focused right on the park, because that's what the city owns. All the surrounding neighbors were suffering the consequences. And that was July, August 2013. December of 13, Renee with uh, Garvet Homes and Bryson came over and met with me. They were trying to buy the property. They actually bought the property next door to us. We we're going to build an apartment complex. They couldn't get a loan. It was a blighted neighborhood. They couldn't get financing to help them. And we're sitting there going, wow, 2003, we got a loan from RDA. Zion's Bank helped us out. What's changed? What happened with our asset? We said, what's going wrong with this? At that point, we got together, and there were about six companies that put in about $10,000 each, actually $20,000 each. This wasn't free, folks. We said, what are we going to do to create a change in this area to clean it up, make it safe? We never excluded the public. We included the city, the state, the county, all the public services, all the service providers and all private owners. There was no rules to get into this club. This was a no rules club, courageous conversation. What are we going to do to clean this up? How are we going to make it safe for our employees, private business owners? How are we going to make it safe for our visitors? 
How are we going to make it safe for visitors that come in out of state? How are we going to make it safe for the homeless? How are we going to remove the criminal element? The drugs, the theft, how many vehicles we have broken into in our parking lot? How many assaults? I have people that work for me, women, that people know their names somehow, and they assault them. If, folks, there's no rules, it's like going back in time. I grew up in a little farm town in New Mexico, never locked the doors. I've been to East LA. I lived in Long Beach. I pretty well traveled my world. Folks, we got a war zone going on here. We can put on the blinders all we want, but this area is going downhill, and we need to help that out. And our path has been, what do we do to improve it? Not go backwards, and we haven't said exclude this group, include this group. It's been courageous conversation from day one. When you have somebody that flies in from San Francisco, rapid transit, right? Well, I'm gonna take the intermodal and I fly to Salt Lake. I don't have to get a rental car. And they bring their suitcase and they drop off our intermodal, and they walk to our office and they walk in and say, where the hell are you guys at? What kind of zoo is this? Walking down the sidewalk, they don't even know what they're stepping in or not stepping in. When we're recruiting employees to the state of Utah, not a very impressive, they say, don't step in that, that's probably not dog. Folks, the day somebody told me I had to get Porter Johns and put them around our building, I lost it. That was a tipping point for me, really? We're zoned to put an ornamental fence around our building. We've always chose not to because we don't want the entrance to the city looking like a prison. All we're asking is can we make a change in this and help our brothers and sisters and help the area? Not go backwards in time. And I can tell you, I feel for those people. You never know who they are. Now with the construction going next door, there's a lot of us walk a block and a half, two blocks to work. In the dark, in the dark. And we'll see what goes on. On the way over here today, what did I have to avoid to step in? What's being smoked on the sidewalks? Our police force, they're, they're incredible warriors, incredible warriors, trying to remove the criminal element that exists here. And I kind of, I will leave you with this. If you don't own a business here, if you don't work here in the Rio Grande District, if you don't visit here often, if you're not a service provider, you might want to roll up your sleeves and tour the area somewhere not between the drive-by at 8 and 5 in the morning. Residents, I'm sorry, I had that on my list. Residents, too. And there's an influx of that. It's about safety and it's about security, folks. Nothing more. In my world, it's about safety and security. I have women that take tracks and they walk in the dark to our office. I wouldn't do that. <coughs> Which other city has an intermodal hub that lands where it does like this. Good luck, but not. With that, Pioneer Park Coalition, we take a lot of shots. Like told Scott, no good deed goes unpunished. We are trying to make a difference. I think I'm giving up on reading the paper because I think we all have horns on us. Folks, I'm proud of this city. I live in Ogden, I commute to Salt Lake City. We have 800 employees in our organization. We do not want to move. We want to make a difference. We want to help others. And I think that's the founding of our, our organization. It really is. So thank you so much for your time. Scott? Yep. So the coalition has close to 300 plus members, although there was a writer that said it was all fake, but we sent out an email to everyone that said, if you don't want to belong, get out and sort of, you can leave and two people sent back so well, that's where we are uh, and I don't usually do this but I'm going to give Daniel a plug I've been passing out these grow box uh, Daniel is uh, Darren excuse me I'm sorry Darren he is the owner operator of this company and we all need to grow food and Darren thank you so much for being a part of it uh, I hope that you guys will take advantage of his grow box for some of the best in the world. so now to our guest speaker uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Marbeck give a uh, share with you who, what, why, where, when, and then we have plenty of time for Q and A. We have mics out in the audience, and everyone is welcome to, to uh, participate, and we want you to participate. Dr. Marbeck um, has a PhD, uh, and he's well known throughout the homeless community. Uh, sometimes he's controversial, and sometimes he's not. 
but I will tell you all the time that he causes us to think and think carefully about what we're doing. Can we improve our best practices? Can we have a transformation? And how the dialogue began with Dr. Marba is a coalition. We were trying to find someone to bring into the city, a third party, that would provide some information for us on best practices. What we can do, what we can't do, what we should do better. And at this, it's a, we were looking at McKenzie, we were looking at, at Ernst & Young, Deloitte, so on and so forth. I happened to run into a colleague of mine who's a Placer County supervisor who said, Scott, we've just gone through this and we found this guy, you ought to talk to him. I called Dr. Marva and he said, I know your city very well. I was on the Olympics and I brought, I bring my family out there skiing. And then he told me this incredible story, shall I let him finish the rest of it. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Robert Marva. But, but, but what I'm going to do, it, it just give you an idea, and I'm, I'm looking at the clock, I, I'm shrinking down what's sort of a, a traditional symposium, because so many people said, can you talk about this, you need to address this. I talked to Travis, I, I don't see Travis, I know he's here out somewhere. There he is in the back. He and I had a conversation outside, 15 minutes, for about 15 minutes. We're going to meet later. But what I'm going to do is shrink this symposium at normally about a three-hour sort of sort of the tour de force on this, shrink it down to about 55 minutes. I'm going to do 35 minutes of Q&A, and then sort of probably cut it off. Then I, then I will stay. Uh, I'll stay till every question. I don't have to be anywhere until breakfast in the morning. So I'll stay the whole time. And, and I, I know Travis's group, he and I are going to try to meet with the group afterwards, so we'd like to uh, do that. I've been coming to Salt Lake City really since the mid-80s on a regular basis. I used to work for the San Antonio Spurs, used to come up in the 80s, and you all used to regularly beat us in the first round. So I spent a lot of time, extra time in the hotels, roaming around, and it came up. And then when I started working for Henry Cisneros, we came up, there were a lot of National League of Cities type meetings, and so I came up and, 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 and visited. And then when you started bidding on the Olympics, I was on the board of uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee for about 13 years. And so I was part of the bid process and come up. And then when we went through all the different challenges we had with the local organizing committee, then we had a bunch of challenges in, in, in Colorado Springs with the USOC. So I got involved in that. And then in, during that time frame, I became an officer of the Olympic Committee. And in Australia, I was given the portfolio on the volunteer side. You always have paid staff and volunteer. I was on the volunteer side. And I was given, because I had some background in it, part of my PhDs in this area and such, and I worked at the White House. I was given the security portfolio in Sydney. Uh, now, they, and normally that's sort of, you know, and Robert will eat this, you know, normally security nobody wanted. And then 9-11 happens. And literally, within 24 hours after we got all our athletes recovered from around the world, we were literally asked and by media and some people inside the government, are we still going to hold the Olympics? And this is after Mitch come in, the change has been made, we had fixed the problems of both Colorado Springs and here, and now we have the 9-11 thing. And so because of that, I ended up spending a lot of time in this community. So I spent a lot of time here, and I've actually met some people I've met before, and then since then I come up skiing, which gets me to the conversation that Scott had. I came um, last Christmas, we were skiing, and we wanted to stay an extra day, and we got a real large family, and so uh, we couldn't find any place on the mountain, so we said, I'll go we'll get a, went to the Marriott right at the Pioneer Park. And so we came down, and um, one in the afternoon, the kiddos, and, and we have a lot of kids, but the, the, the youngest kiddo, uh, six, seven, and eight, and they wanted to go see the, the movie. So we were going to walk from there up to the movie theater. So that's what we're planning on doing. So we get out of the movie, come and rock on the north side of Pioneer Park, walking up, and a fight breaks out between three homeless people that like is on top of our three little kids. I mean, literally, it's like this. The fight is breaking out with this kid over here. And it, I've been in the world of homeless, so I sort of was trying to de-escalate. And I said, you know, I get the idea for your fight. Why don't you take it over there? Don't do it in front of the kids. I certainly don't want the kids hurt. So we're trying to separate the three kids from these three guys fighting. Two were very, very respectful and were very willing to be. Another one confronted me and said, you know, what do you mean? We can fight where we want. 
And it, that was the conversation that went on. So we ended up, got through that, went out to the park, uh, went to the movie theater, got our tickets. By now, we missed that showing. There was another one running about 45 minutes later. So we decided to get haircuts, went into the, uh, the, the, the salon there, and three or four of us were getting haircuts. We said, well, how is it, you know, you know just conversation here and there. And she says, you know, we're thinking about moving our salon because we've lost 40% of our clientele in the last year. And she then proceeded to tell us why she thought she was losing the clientele. And it was about the homeless situation going on. And then we went, saw the movie, went to eat upstairs. And then on our way back, because it was really, it was real cool. It was very snowing. And some of the kids were in a snowball fight. So one group of us is moving up front. And I'm moving in the front group. And then there's the back group. And uh, five homeless people came up and accosted the back end group. I mean, literally accosted and were grabbing our people. I mean, like just grabbing them. And you give us money, we want money, and such like that. It wasn't a, a traditional panhandle, it was a very aggressive engagement. And so we finally got back you know, to the hotel and we decided, you know what, we're not going to stay down, the, you know, we, we will stay at that hotel, but we weren't going to do anything from then forth. And we'd gone up on that Sunday earlier in the day, we'd gone up to Temple, we did services, came back down, came, you know, walking all around, went over to, uh, uh, for Chinese food. And it was a completely different city than what I had seen over the last few years. It was, uh, the situation was more aggressive, uh, the situation was higher volume uh, than before. And what, this was, what was struck me so wild is I've been reading all the literature about the drop in homelessness in Utah from the national, all the national programs. It was like the tale of two cities. Um, I, was, I had just finished in October reading this whole report about what had happened in Utah, and, it, and basically the report said there's only 159 homeless people left in the entire state. That was the report I read. And, and I, I, of all people, know when you're reading the media, it's not always accurate. But it, I was re reading this and going, wow, this is great, yet, and, and then when I started looking more into it, and then Scott gives me a call, and I said, boy, let me tell you my experience. And so that's the first-hand experience that, that, that I had. And, and I was just really struck by, on one side, uh, Utah's ending its homeless situation, which is literally the title of several reports that came out, versus what I had seen and what I had experienced and such. And so, and I've been doing, I've been, I started at working in the homeless world as a youth group, just like many people. I gave out food in parks, I gave out t-shirts in parks, gave out, you know, in the south, and you may not need as much, but we get out a lot of suntan lotion because it's free cancer, uh, cancer with individuals experience homelessness is a big idea because of exposure, gave out glasses. And I did that in my high school, went away to, to college, came back and re-engaged with the, our church group, and I found the same exact individuals were still on the street. And we were having people die in San Antonio. That we finally, what finally crystallized the change in San Antonio is a person died on the steps of our main downtown Presbyterian church, and people were coming in service, and there's an EMS unit with a person who died that was discovered by one of the parishioners. And that's what catalyzed people said, what we're doing is not working. I mean, it, people are dying. This is the thing. And then when we started researching, we found out people were dying in the police custody chain. And it was dying, and we used to call it, not me at all, a term I've never ever used, but it was the police drunk tank. And when you went there, they literally called it the drunk tank. And people were dying in that chain of custody. And what we started finding out, our homeless population was dying and was not getting the help that was needed we kept seeing the same people, and then the tourism was starting to get affected at the Alamo and the Riverwalk. So this wasn't working for anybody. This wasn't working for the individuals experiencing homeless. It wasn't working for the community, and it wasn't working for the agencies. Yet we continue to do the same thing the same old way because we've always done it that way. That's what was happening. And so uh, we started doing different things, and then I, you know, we got involved in, in, in what we started to realize and we, when we came to a point of finally saying we're going to help create Haven for Hope, and for you don't know, Haven for Hope, and I don't at all think this is what you all need, but because we have, each community has different needs. But in San Antonio, we were tasked by the, the state government to work 22 counties. That was going to be our area. So we created Haven for Hope, 
Think of it as a community college campus designed to graduate you off the street, and it has about 2,200 people in a given night. We have four sub-campuses, about 400 plus or minus that are in the veteran program. We have about 1,000, uh, 950,000 in the transformational program. Then we have a family and children program, and then we have a prospects courtyard, and they all interwork and enter together. We have now 93 agencies involved. When I was there, we had nine, uh, it, when I was there, we had 78 agencies start uh, with it. We have about 158 functionalities. We do everything from haircuts, mental health, crisis, substance abuse, job training, job placement. We have a bank on campus. We have a hair salon on campus. We have all sorts of levels of sleeping based off of functionality. We have, in one building, we have 45 agencies in the building. And so when you come in for referrals, you stay in the building and you get more service hits in one day. Rather than, here's a map, maybe you get money and go across town and go hit an agency that you can't ever find. And so we, that, when we were working on creating Haven for Hope, what we started to realize is we needed to just, it, it's basically, if you want to change, you gotta make change. And if you want big change, you gotta make big change. And if you just say, you know what, what we got is working, and all I do is challenge is go down to the police station, the new substation there, look at the bureau, look to the right two blocks, look to the left two blocks, and look down the street three blocks, and just say, is this working for anybody? Does this work for the individuals who experience homelessness? Absolutely not. Does it work for the agencies? They're struggling, they're stretched, they're, they're, it's not working. And if you look at the community, it's clearly choking part of the community there, so this is not working. So you gotta first make a decision, this is not working, we're going to make a change. I, you know, when I've been involved in these, if you wanna just say, give me 4% more money for my agency and I'll give you 4% more outputs next year, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about complete structural change. And the cities that are doing this, are having incredible success rates. In San Antonio, we now have 2,100 people that have graduated from our program in the last four years that are no longer homeless. And we define that as one year out, not re-entering homeless. That's our number one measurement. I don't measure meals or apples given out or t-shirts given out. I don't measure how many mats and beds. What I measure is how many graduates do you have? How many people did you help create an environment that are no longer homeless? That's what I'm about. And I get, you know, Travis and I are having a conversation, and clearly people are reading things in different places. I got Fort Lauderdale that quotes me is why they're doing something. I've never even met with the people in these quotes in Fort Lauderdale. But what I do know is cities can do this and make change if you want to. And you can totally restructure your system from top to bottom, refix it and revamp it, and you can get success for everybody. This is not about helping this group, and not helping them, or moving these people, or move the cheese. That doesn't work. All those are gimmicks. They don't work. The way you make change is to get individuals graduate. If we can help this individual graduate, then this individual graduate, it helps them. That's the building block, it's the individual. And then over time, as we aggregate that, it starts to improve your community. But you have to start with graduation rates. And so, to, and let me go through a few cities just real quick. San Antonio is good, not perfect. Not, I mean, there are things I would still change today. There are things there that we are trying to change. But what we do know is San Antonio, because they're the following stats. We have 2,100 graduates who are no longer homeless and well on many other ways in the past. We now have 700 less people on a given night in jail that used to be criminalized who used to put in jail. I am so against criminalization, it doesn't work. If it worked, we could have a conversation about the financial feasibility. So let's pretend like it worked. In San Antonio, putting somebody in jail is about $130 a night. What we do over at Haven for Hope is about $15 to $30 a night, which is better. You don't get recovery on a jail cell floor. You never get recovery on a jail cell floor. It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna get recovery. You get recovery in a 24-7 program. Likewise, you don't get recovery on a park bench either. Those aren't where recovery happens. Recovery doesn't happen on a park bench. Recovery doesn't happen in jail. And I, I, Travis and I, and I don't mean to call you out, Travis, but, but he's called me out for the last two days, so I figured it's fair. 
I asked him as a dad, he's a dad, he has four kids, and I said, if your kids got to be 17 or 18, and they were addicted to substance abuse or had a mental health problem, what would you try to do? He said, I'd try to get them to treatment, okay? And I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, I want to get them to treatment. So, and, you know, he and I sort of walked through a story, and obviously we were playing with it, you know, intellectually playing with each other, but, but would the response be give you a food card and get you an apartment? Or is the response get you in a treatment program and get you in recovery? That's what we're talking about. 90% of the individuals, not my numbers, that numbers, 90% of the people that are homeless have mental health, substance abuse, or co-presenting. And the substance abuse is not recreational drug use. This is where the far right totally misses it. Drug use on the street is self-medicating because the mental health is not getting dealt with. And it's also about how to get to sleep at night. Those are the two things that go on. It is not about, I have so much money and I can become a recreational drug user. I have maybe met three or four homeless people out of the thousand homeless individuals I've engaged with that, that, that are recreational drug users. But that's just a myth. That's a huge myth that the far right does. The other myth the far right does is sort of tells you, you chose to be homeless. And where that comes from is, I think it was in 1983, Ronald Reagan did a speech, and I think it's from the Roosevelt Room, that he in essence said, my words, and I've tried to get the tape of it, and I've never been able to find the tape, but I've heard it quoted so many times, and think that basically said, within eight blocks of the White House here, we have people who chose to be homeless. And if you start with the idea that you choose to be homeless, the assumption of solution is you choose to unbe homeless. And if Ronald Reagan was right and says, you chose to be homeless, then all you got to do is unchoose to be homeless. And then we've solved our problem. But that's not the reality of what really happens on the street. What really happens on the street, and this is why you have to understand the true triggers of homelessness. The triggers of homelessness, if you really want poor solutions to get people to really graduate as individuals, you got to start with what the triggers are, because that will tell you what the solutions are. Real triggers in real life are people who have mental health issues that didn't get help. And that's the number one issue. If you can solve one thing, if you said you can only do one thing, you can only move one lever, and that's the lever, that's it. When Ronald Reagan took office, and, and he did also the same thing when he was governor, when he took office, there was 475,000 federally funded mental health beds, ballpark, that, you know, and there are different programs and different things, but if we're trying to do our best we can to do apple to apple, the 1980, January 21st, 475,000 mental health beds. Today, 92,000 mental health beds. Our country's grown 18%, but we have 400,000 less beds. Where do those individuals go? Our jails, not the right place. You don't get mental health services in most jails. ERs, emergency rooms, or our streets or in our shelters. That's why mental health is so important, so critical. And then when you add in post-traumatic stress of veterans, and there's a whole lot of literature on this, there's tons of literature, places like San Diego, San Antonio, North Carolina, that are high military areas are seeing this just unbelievable numbers. And it's approaching a third. And over time, that third is going to envelop the rest of the country. That you're going to have serious mental health issues and it's connected to, I mean, it's not veterans. It's combat veterans out of the U.S. Marine Corps and Bravo 11, 11 Bravo Infantry, Army Infantry. That's it. You don't go to barber school and come homeless. But if you're in the Marine Corps or the U.S. Army Infantry and you're serving our country on our behalf, whether you agree with the war or disagree with the war, you, an average person now downrange, has been there five times. <coughs> Vietnam, you were... One, only one and a half percent of the people who went to Vietnam served more than one tour of duty. Most people don't realize that. Once you served your tour in Vietnam, you came back. Vietnam, you served 12 months. Now you serve 15 months because of stop loss, stop gap. Vietnam, they tried, not all the units were good this way, but they tried to give you about a third down range, you know, in, in hot zone, a third in the back area, and a third R&R. &R. R&R &R now in our areas is sitting in a building and having RPG hit the roof and, and you're, you're safe, you're not going to die, but, but that's not R&R, &R, having RPG hit on your roof at night and going off, that's not relaxation at all, not even close. And if you take women, a lot of people don't understand, we have roughly one-fourth of our troops and service 
people, service women, service men, poor men, poor women, even postcards downrange now. One fourth are females. So the females get all the post-traumatic stress, and then if you saw the Senate hearings earlier in the year, one third of women are reporting sexual assault, sexual, you know, some sort of sexual violence and such on them from our own team. Not from locals, but from fellow service men. And so the women, we wonder why, we're already starting to see combat veteran women in shelters now in this country. They're just something you couldn't even imagine. Well, they have all the post-traumatic stress and they have domestic violence. That's, in essence, what it is. And so mental health is your number one deal. And if Ronald Reagan was right, all you got to do is have everybody wake up in the morning and decide I don't want to be homeless. It's not going to happen. The next is substance abuse. Most of substance abuse is intertied with mental health, not all. But substance abuse to being able to sleep at night on the street is a huge issue. That's why in the places that we really run, not ones you read about, the first 10 days our focus is hydration, nutrition, and sleep. That's what we want in the first 10 days. And what we have found is that you can get hydration, and the reason why people in homeless places, remember most homeless places, not totally true in your situation, is drier in the summer, but most homeless are in Southern California, South Texas, South Florida, 95 degrees, 95 of humidity, and we have people who are sub-toxic uh, because they don't hydrate. You wonder why they don't hydrate, they don't want to get asked by the police officers, and or there's no bathrooms to go to. So people are always sub, what well, they don't have enough water on board. And so when you don't have enough water on board and you take meds, legal or illegal, you have amplified effect, depressive or, or agitation, either direction. And then if you're not eating well, you even have, makes the whole thing worse. So what we spend the first 10 days is trying to stabilize you. And you stabilize by drinking as much hydration as you can. And by the way, there's a bathroom there, and we're not going to rescue you. It's right there. It's 20 feet away from where you feed. It's right there. Just like when we go to restaurants, or if we were to go to a restaurant, the, the bathroom and the dining room is there. If you're homeless, you might have food here, and the bathroom's a mile and a half away <laughs> in some communities. That's, that's crazy. Why do we say, and then we arrest you for going to the bathroom because you have to walk a mile and a half away? This is insane what we're doing in some parts of this country. And so you, you have to deal with that substance abuse. And the best way in substance abuse trigger is stabilization. That's nutrition, water, sleep. And when the more sleep you get, the less you have to dope up to order to numb yourself at night. I always, when I do, I do a lot of middle class churches, and I always go in and they, they, they give food in the park and they think they understand it. I say, I, in most communities, I go spend three or four days being homeless. I get undercover. I, I mean, you won't find me. I spend time in. And I'll sometimes take people with me. I say, come with me. And you're, first off, when you go to sleep at night, it's going to be a hard, it's going to be a hard surface. If you go into the bushes, it'll be softer, but the trade-off is you get critters, bugs, and mice. So you got a trade-off. Your temperature is going to move 45 degrees in a night, not seven at home. That moves up and down. You're going to have police come by and, and, and check on you every so often. And it could, depending on your community, it could be very friendly check on or a less friendly check on. If you're at the beginning of the month and you got your cash because you got a federal check, you cash it because no bank will work with you. And so now you got money in your pocket and you get rolled at the beginning of the month because people target homeless people. Homeless people are generally more victimized than they are predators in most cases, in most places. And so, how are you going to sleep at night if I did that with you? You know yourself, this ambient. And so, it, you know, sleeping at night, it, it, there's a sudden, and so as soon as you start taking substance to go to sleep, you start that downhill thing and it starts to get very, very, very unproductive at, at that point in time. So, that's another trigger, substance abuse. Um, men, there's a third chair, it's a lot smaller, it's what I call job retention. Most homeless people can get jobs. Most people, oh, there are tons of programs that place you on jobs. I met one employer yesterday, he's had four homeless people start there, out of three of them quit after one day, but they got the job. Job retention, life skills, learning how to show up on time, stay on time, be properly dressed, how to properly keep the job is job retention. 
There's tons of programs that get you the job, but what I'm always shocked is there are very few jobs that show you how to keep the job. And so mental health, substance abuse, then a lot lower is job retention. On women, women have two additional issues that the males don't have. They have all this, but two additional issues. They have domestic violence triggered. And I see over and over and over women staying in bad situations because they don't want to lose their secondary paycheck. And so they get beat up so the kids don't get beat up or they get beat up and not order to get their, their, their check or to keep money going. And if you're in a high occupancy area, and I found out yesterday you're about 97.4, I think is the number we were given yesterday. That means rent rates go up. I get, you know, as if, if you're in a place like Tulsa, Oklahoma, that's running about 20% vacancy, a whole different economic model. But if you're in, the, in a place like Salt Lake City, San Diego, Houston, any of the beach areas in Florida, the cost is really high to live. And so if you're a two-couple person on minimum wage, or $10 wage, let's even call it $10, and you're each working 2,000 hours, that's $4,000, and one person breaks away from the relationship for whatever reason, they just, they leave. Or, or, or the woman breaks away, and it's normally a female, breaks away to take the safety of the kids, they suddenly have lost half their income. So do you think that housing is affordable in the local community when you take away half the income and you are already on minimum wage? No, it's not going to happen. So women get the domestic violence issue, and they also get this economic triggering that's connected to that. Those are your five main triggers of homelessness. And I will challenge you over and over and over. You're not going to find some, tell, show me somebody who became homeless because they were hungry. Not happening. In fact, every place I've ever built, ever designed, has 21 mills built into it that are proper nutrition, that have the proper balance, that has the proper calorie. You won't go hungry if you're in any of my programs, ever. You'll never need to beg, grovel, or steal for anything ever in your life if you're in one of my programs and you're, you're eating the 21 meals. In most homeless places, functionally provide 21 meals. They either do it across the street, together, or in a partnership. That, that's true in most programs. Not all, but, but most programs. Hunger's not the, not the problem. So if, if you think hunger's the problem, then you think food is the solution. If mental health is the problem, food is not the solution. The other is, I think of losing a roof over your house or over yourself, that's a symptom of your problem that is not actually the problem itself, and it's certainly not the root cause. And I really get banged from the left on this. I mean, I get banged from the right, but I also get banged from the left. Hunger is not your issue. A roof over your head is not your issue. You, it's these other triggers that cause stuff, and normally people don't go into homeless one day, it's a series of bad things, you lose your credit, you don't pay a bill, then you start balancing your bills, then you gotta decide between food, between medicine, between childcare, or paying your gas car to get to work, it's a slow process. But the day the sheriff locks you out of your apartment, the process speeds up. And sadly, normally it's at five o'clock because mom was away with the kids, picking the kids up working, and comes home and it's five or six o'clock at night, you get there and you're locked out, where do you go? And we, in Sarasota, a place we've been working with, one of the most successful family and children programs we now got in America, Sun Blue. In under 18 months, we have already opened two complete new centers. We have a 24 7 emergency center, North County and South County, if you're family and children. So you call 211, you call 911. Any police, any pastor, any rabbi, any cleric knows what to do. You get to this place, it's a physical place. We have housing for you. We, we've never, we always have housing for you. And not only that, when you get there, we're going to get you food, we're going to get you clothing, and we're going to make sure your kiddo stays in their home school that next day. This place used to have, a, when we started there two years ago, literally two years ago, 145 families in car, not family units, but county kids, moms, living in cars behind big box place. And the county is about half a million people. At 145, every given night, any day of the week, just day in and day out, week in and week out. We now have zero in cars, and the group that, that I helped manage and help structure, and on, and on their own, not me, this wasn't me, the group came up with it, and they said, we were measuring by how many kids missed a school day at their home school. How many people went, they're now measuring a new measurement. 
How fast from the moment of crisis to when they are in their new place? And you know what measurement they're using? Minutes. I was shocked. I was with them on Monday. I was shocked. That, that's on their own. They, they've taken what we're doing, our principles, and they said, because the fastest way to, to reduce crisis is to shorten that amount of time of crisis that the kiddos experience. That's why I am so against families and children being mixed with chronic men and women or adult men and women. Some of what I saw yesterday is the saddest thing I've ever seen. I saw, single, I saw families with children on a school day, on a street, commingled with, with adult homeless. I saw families with children, real young children, eating in, with in individuals. That is horrible on so many different levels. That shows your system's not working. It shows your systems are, are misvalued, misplaced. And, it show, and, I'm not, and I want to be really careful. You got three core agencies there that are doing amazing things. They have the right heart. They're incredible. And they're the people you got. They're your building blocks for the future. They're your part of your solution to the future. They're well intended, but they are stretched. They are so stretched. And, and some of the functionalities can't physically fit in their buildings. So don't blame them for that. That's part of the system problem. This is a system problem, not one agency or one this or, or, or one that. So if, if you look at other cities, cities around this country have been phenomenally successful at doing this who choose to be successful. You can reduce your jail population because you don't arrest people anymore. Now, if you essentially saw or pull a gun on a weapon, I got accused by somebody in the far right a couple weeks ago that said, you give all the homeless people get out of jail card. You never, you never did. If you pull a gun on somebody and fire a shot, you should go to jail. I don't care if you're homeless or who you are, you go to jail. But for Mickey Mouse, stupid little things that are survivability issues of trying to go to the bathroom, eat, or find a place to sleep, you should never arrest a person. That person, that individual, should go into a 24-7 treatment program, if that's your goal. If your goal is to get recovery, go to a treatment program. If your goal is to avoid recovery, stay on the park bench. If your goal is to criminalize, put them in jail. But you're not going to get recovery here, and you're not going to get recovery there. And so let's, let me move to some of the solutions that I want to go through and then talk some specific observations, and then we'll open it up at uh, Q&A. Uh, we have three, and you can go to the website and see a lot more of this. I encourage you to go to my website, not what the Huffington Post writes about me or the NBC writes about me. Go, go to what I actually, and certainly don't go to um, the Fort Lauderdale City Council. I've never even met them. I've never been to City Hall. I've never even been called by them, yet they're quoting me. So, so be careful on that. First is, the cities that make big things is they change from an agency-centric model, siloed agencies, they move to systems. They move to systems approach, where we all work together. We need everybody. In those three agencies you got down there, we got to have them. They're part of the future. They're part of the solution. They're the building block. They're incredibly well focused. They're incredibly in engineered, and boy, do they do they do that by the bootstraps. What they do that. It's amazing how much goes on with how little they get. But you have to become an integrated systems approach where you share case management. You share people. You figure out if I have to have close my place at seven, you open at seven oh one, not a gap in time. You figure out the systems together. You have a common entry. And one of your real strengths is your HMIS system. I know some of that's inside baseball for you and some of you don't care. You have an incredible HMIS system that is very well together and it's an asset you have. That also is part of that logistical building block. Most people don't care about HMIS. But for the people in the field who really do solutions, that is one of the hardest things to get together. You already got that. You know, there's some things you're ahead of the game in, and so that's one. So, yeah, number one, you've got to move from agency-centric to system-centric, and you should never, ever again talk about an agency. You should talk about a system, period. Second issue is you, you, you want to um, change how you measure things, because what gets measured gets done. It's like in academics in school. If you're in business practice, Peter Drucker talked about it. I went to Claremont College, so Peter Drucker talked a lot about this. Peter, Tom Peters talks about it. what gets measured gets done. And if you measure 
how many food you give out in a park, how many mats you have on the floor, how many bed nights do you have, that's what it gets focused on. If you say, how many people graduated from your program and you never saw them ever again, and they never went homeless ever again, they never touched HMIS, they didn't move to another state to become homeless, and they're, they're completely self-sufficient, that's the measurement I want. That's the measurement I want. I want to know, have we dropped the load on the emergency room? Have we stopped arresting people for Mickey Mouse stuff? I want to know if, and so what I measure is graduations, jail reduction, emergency load reduction, and visual street homelessness. Those are my four measures. I don't measure how many, you know, the uh, toiletry kits you give out, how many mats people slept on. I don't even care about that. Because if you measure that, you're gonna, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna do more mats. You're gonna do more suntan lotion. You're gonna do more sandwiches in a park. That doesn't, none of that addresses solving real homeless. So if you really want to solve homeless, measure something that's about success. And so change your measurements will change what you focus on, change you do. Now, the, the third one, and this is where Travis and I got in our conversation outside, is enabling versus engaging. And I, I enabled for 25 years. For 25 years, I gave food out in parks with church programs, brought t-shirts out, gave out glasses with the Lions Club, gave out suntan lotion. And you know what? There wasn't one day did I ever do anything to help a person graduate from the street. Not once. Never, ever. There was nothing I ever did to help a person for 22, 23 years of working. And then when I realized if I don't change, we're not going to see change. So that's what happened. And so you have to move from an enablement to an engagement. That doesn't mean you don't food. You'll never see me read right if you go to me, not to support Lauderdale City Council. I have never said don't feed a person, ever. All I've said is move your location, three blocks, four blocks, five blocks, and put it next to her agency and feed out the front door next to her agency. Or, if you're really determined because there's something really holy about that park, come on over, health care, mental care, job training, come join us in the park because there's something real special going on in the park here, and do it there at the park. I don't care where it is, but you have to co-locate the agencies. You have to make things that are non-core, the, the, the non-core issues. Feeding is not a core issue in the world of homeless. Sleeping is actually not a core issue of homeless. Mental health, substance abuse, domestic violence, and security for moms in domestic violence. Those are your core issues. Those are your core triggers. Those triggers gotta get solved if you wanna solve homeless. Feeding's not gonna solve homeless. But feeding is part of an overall system that you have to have. So you want those 21 meals to be co-located where the solutions are for your core triggers. Wherever you put that, put that in the same place, and then you're going to be you're going to be fine. So whatever you do, you got to align that. So the, so the three again are agency to system, outputs to outcomes, and then don't enable, engage, engage people in recovery. Do what you do, does that help them move a step closer to getting into treatment? Or does that allow you to stay on a park bench? Or does that get you arrested? And the far right does this, and they think they're solving it, and go, you know, they'll be, that person will be out of jail in five hours. <laughs> far left, go look at the park bench, that guy or gal will be there tomorrow. That's not where recovery occurs. Recovery occurs in the middle. That's at the logical middle. Um, I don't think I have time to go through the seven things, but I want a lot of time for Q&A. On my website, I got seven. Uh, I, I talked to Travis, and it, 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 he, it, to his absolute fairness, he's read tons of stuff. And he says, I agree with one through five, but I disagree with number six. So, Travis, sorry, you can respond later if I got it wrong. Just um, so I disagree with six. Well, the reason why that's number six is you don't do that until you do the top five. You have to do this in an order. The top three need to be done together. You've got to get your capacity up. You've got to get your functionality up. You have to integrate the systems and all that. You've got to do that first. Then you do number six. And six is about culture. I've never criminalized. I, I just don't think ordinances generally don't work. I mean, sometimes you have to have them for, for a small group of people, and that's fine. But it's better to change the culture of the community than it is to try to mandate it. 
And as I told NBC News, it's never going to be a good day if you arrest a 94-year-old African-American pastor on television. It is not going to be a good day for you, ever. And, and then that gentleman, he started bringing two other pastors. All three of these pastors are over 90. If you watch what's happening in Fort Lauderdale, they keep arresting these guys. And they're giving them fines and arresting them. It's still going on. All it did was make more people come to Fort Lauderdale to help this guy out. That didn't work. I mean, if, if it was working, we could say it's politically incorrect, but it's working. But it's not even working. You know, that's what I had the problem about jail is jail doesn't work and it costs you $130. But these type of programs can be done at $15 to $30 on an aggregated level. And so it doesn't work. So the, if, if you look at those seven, I'm happy to answer any questions on those seven, but the key thing to understand, six comes after you do one, two, three, four, and five. Then you relocate. Until then, keep doing what you're doing. But once you get that together, then you relocate the feeding program. You invite everybody in. We need everybody's help. I tell you, if you we should have had this meeting right at that point. I had one city in California I was working with. The mayor literally said there was no homeless in our city. And I took a video and put it on PBS. I still got it on my thing now. We went to an encampment, 160, no, 1,650 people in an encampment, eight blocks away from City Hall. So the next day when we had a meeting, because she wanted to talk to me after we put it up on PBS, I said, let's have the meeting down there. She refused to have the meeting there. I think you should have every meeting as a stand-up meeting right at the core. Go to his substation. Sit there, stand up, and work it out right there. That's where the real part of the problem is, not all the stuff. And so, um, so if you want to go through those seven later, I can go through it and look at it. But the key is to understand six occurs after one through five is completed, or well on it, or, or you do it in conjunction. But you don't jump to six and skip the, you know, the, you know, you, you take an exam after you prepare for exam and take the class. You don't just, and I know I'm going to get in deep trouble on these, but let me pull them out so I make sure I got them. I've only been in Salt Lake City looking at this for about 36 hours. So I know I've missed things. I know there's some things I don't know, but I don't know yet. I get that, but I was asked to come in. Uh, I, I, I'm not being paid to come in. I came in you know, on my own nickel. Um, and, and so I, these are quick observations I got. I covered as much ground as I could. Um, many of these are very common to other cities. We see this around. Uh, so I may get it a little off, but I think we're going to get in a, in a ballpark area. Um, first is you all have buried your lead. That if you keep going around thinking you've, you're at zero homeless, because that's what the media talks about you all outside the city, if that's what you buy into, and, and, and the program that you have is critical, and I'm going to talk about it in a sec, is absolutely critical that you keep that program going and work it and grow it and nurture it and sustain it. But if you sit there and say your problem is solved, just come with me. Let's walk four blocks and let's look at what's, what's going on. And you're going to instantly say, it's not working for anyone. It's not working for that family commingled with the people on the street. It's not working for the police. It's not working for the fire department. It's not working for the neighborhood. It's not working for the agency. Other than that, the program seems to be going really well. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I think, you know, it, the, you know, I, I, I know it's sort of a joke when you're talking about mental health and substance treatment, but you've got to really realize there's a problem. You know, the first thing is you've got to realize what the problem is and what the problem is not. It's also important to realize there are a lot of myths, and the right wing does a lot of myths. Right wing does, you chose to be homeless. They only want to be homeless. And you know what? For the grace go, I go then, you know, I would be there. I've made many of the same knuckleheaded decisions in my life that many of these people I work with every single day did, but I was lucky I had a family that, or a support group or a resource group or individuals who sat me down and helped me when I was being stupid, or else I would have been right on the street just like these individuals. Everybody's had these same triggers. The difference is, in the homeless world, there are external triggers, but they don't have the internal resources to recover from. And then one little decision makes another little bad decision, and it, it, it collectively comes we're at the situation you're in. So the, the lead is we still have 14,000 homeless people in Utah. That's lead. Not 
We're at only have 189 chronic left. That's very important. It's a very important success. It's a sliver of the problem. It's a, it's a section of the problem. But if you don't realize, and your numbers, by the way, from what I can piece together in point in time, they actually went up slightly. That should have been the lead. Homeless goes up slightly. Or still 14,000 people. I mean, not homeless ends. And I've read so many articles about homeless ends, and when I get, went out there did, yesterday, I was just shocked. So, so you got to understand. Um, your fire department, this is next observation, your fire department and police department are incredible resources. Don't treat them as the enemy, especially the fire department. I'm at police, I guess I'm joking. But, but fire department, why would you pick on the fire department? The fire department has 8,000 calls into this area, right in here. 8,000 calls. Um, 5,000 of them are unfunded. Totally, completely unfunded starting at about $1,500 a response up to 4,500 response. 70% of them are, are, are tied to homeless individuals. Run the math, you get to $8 million, $2 million gets funded, you're in a whole $6 million. We are right now, just in this neighborhood, right in this area, spend $6 million of taxpayers' dollars to get people to a hospital, which means you've broken down what's working, that something's not working. Now, if you're having a heart attack or stroke, we need EMS, we need first responder, we need to go to the hospital. But that's not what's, these are aspirin calls. These are Mickey Mouse calls, for the most, the most. And it's overloading the system. Then when people get to ER, most ERs around America is $3,000 to walk in the door before you get any treatment or any referral. And so you've not only wasted your first responder, you're now wasting your money, you know, with the emergency room. So, and then police, roughly 25% of all the calls now are happening right in this area. That, and, and, and not all that's homeless, but a large number of that is homeless. And so it, it, talk to your police, talk to your fire, and ask them what's working what's not, because they're right there and they're, they're seeing it. Um, street problem is getting worse, but what's more concerning to me, because I'm not sure, I, I think the extra attention being paid is making people more sensitive, so there's maybe more reporting. You may be an artifact of the enlightened sensitivity. But what everybody told me, from fire department to homeless individuals themselves, to people in the agencies, to just seeing my experience, is getting more aggressive. And that means frustration. And when you have frustration, that means something's not working. And so it's the aggressiveness that's increasing that I think is the bigger challenge than the number. Um, uh, you, in essence, and, and I'm going I'm to jump to, I'm going to skip a couple. Um, you should never, ever, ever commingle families with adult chronic homeless. Never. That is just a fundamental thing you should never, ever do. And what Miami taught me is if you have to use the same building, and, they, and Miami is a real tight, real postage stamp. They made it where homeless families eat first, and they are, when they're finished, then somebody else comes in the door. You feed families first, nobody else comes in, then when they exit, then you feed everybody else. Because the trauma that occurs to the kiddos is horrifying. And when you start talking to case managers who work for those kiddos on the street, they think that is normal. And if that's their new normal, what's going to happen to them when they become 18 and 19 and 20? So you never mix families and children, period. Period. There's no reason ever to do that. Yet I saw that all day, day long yesterday. Um, housing first is very important. It's a tool we use. One fourth of San Antonio is housing first. A lot of people, again, media make me out to say I don't do it. There's only one tool. It's one tool in a toolbox. It's a good tool. It works. But I'm worried about your housing first, because your housing first numbers got up for two reasons. You had extra stimulus money, and it was when your occupancy rate was lower, and you had a lower rental rate. As the rental rate climbs, you're going to have less funding, meaning less slots. And I, and I tried real honestly to try to find if I could figure out a way to get the numbers today. And I only had one anecdotal person who told me it's, you're going to lose hundreds in the next few months. You know, when you look at the financing on that, you got to figure out a way to keep every one of those slots because whatever you got now would be a lot worse if you didn't have that. 
And so you got to figure out the slots, but you are artificially high because of stimulus money that's no longer existing, and you're artificially high because of the rate uh, you had. Um, and they're, they're, okay, I'm going to go right to, we talk, already talked about a couple of these, so let me go to just the two final things. And I've been asked this by the media, they all ask me. And, and first off, I actually think you, and I, and I know I'm really going to get in trouble here, this is a leadership question. This is not a housing question. It's not even a food question. It's not a root cause. You have five different groups that I can count on that's trying to solve this. There's no way you would ever run a real business by creating five different task forces to try to solve something. I mean, that, just, that just wouldn't happen. If you really want to solve this, you need to merge all those groups into one, and you need to keep the thing into under 10 people. In San Antonio, we started out at five who can make decisions and make decisions and work, and then when we opened, we were at nine people. You don't need groups of 30 and task force of 50 and study groups and advisory groups. And, and it's sad to me, it is really sad when the city has a group and the county has a group. They should be the same exact group. And I'm talking as an outsider, to me that's common sense. But everybody I bring that up to you says, you've got to understand this. I mean, everybody tells me a story. If you really want to solve the problem, you don't create two groups, one at the city, one at the county. The state has a group out there. The Coalition of Care, which is the only official designated group for HUD, it has a group. Pioneer Park has a group going. And I'm sure you'll probably find some task force somewhere else with other people trying to work. Everybody should be on one team. We should select a small group of leaders, get out of the way, and let us be followers, and follow good decision making, logical decision making. Which then gets me to the punchline. Are you wanting to move everybody out of town? And I've answered to everybody, I don't know. I, I, mean, it, you, I don't even know where it's the right place yet because nobody's ever studied it. But what I do know is you, in essence, have a campus right now. You have a mall right now. You have things, if, if you were to start like a mall, you have the building blocks right now. But it is absolutely dysfunctional. It's not systematic. It's not ergonomic. It's not strategically designed. The best I can tell is everything there is a series of little decisions that were made over time that in isolation probably were good decisions by well-intended people, but now you got this aggregated thing that just simply is, if, if anybody went down there and looked at it and just looked at the street, I went through there four times yesterday. If anybody went through with me, you would not say this is working. And, and so one person said, well, that's because the, the Catholic group had their place closed, it's getting new carpets, rehabbing, and such. Well, I went in there, that can only fit 70 people, and, then, and they say they don't even like that many, but they can fit 70. Well, there was about 200 to 300 people right in that front area, so that's not working either. That's not an excuse, that's a purely an excuse. So if you want to do this, you got to start strategically, start with your root cause, go to your functionality, Go to your building blocks. You've got three good starting agencies. That's your building block. Your HMIS is your integration system. And then run a cost analysis of what it would take to make that area run correctly. And that's your baseline number. Because you already have a campus. You already have a mall. Whatever way you want to call it, you already got it. It's horribly designed. It's strategically inefficient. And it doesn't work, but you got one. So the question is, can you fix that one and what would the cost to fix it? Which means you need to update the facilities because they're old and, and some of them in, in really bad shape. Some are not right size at all. Some need to be moved around. You need to do some moving, but you can do that. If people want to do it, you can really do it. And you don't need to study this for three or four years. Sarasota, 18 months ago, I said we got a family crisis, 145 people sleeping overnight. Within, two, within 18 months, both the facilities were open. Haven for Hope, the first meeting I went to when we first opened our first building was under two years. We had two buildings open within two years and three months. So you can move quickly and get to that if you want to. You don't need to study this forever. But also don't make Noah's Ark. If you put everybody on that ship to try to make that decision, you're never going to get a decision. It needs to be a small task force of community leaders who, who are real smart. Candidly, they probably shouldn't have any skin in the game. I know that's controversial, but if you want, you need to get the elders of your community 
that care about this community, that live in this community, who want the best, not because they want an agency to get more money, or they want people to move away, or don't want them to move away, or don't want. You need to find out what the baseline cost is to fix your situation as it is. Then, and simultaneously, take the same agencies, the same functionality, the same system, and then run a pricing model of a new location. And I think it's, I literally don't think it's that more complicated. And all these task force out here, I think you literally should get in on a list. Here's our core problems. Here's our core solutions. Here, or the, here are the triggers. Here are the solutions. Here are the agencies. Also, there's, I mean, nobody yesterday told me anything about mental health. The mere fact that I went, I've now gone two days and I bring up mental health and nobody else brings it up. Who, where is your mental health crisis center? It should be right wherever that is. Whereas your ongoing outpatient crime and mental health should be right there too. Not a referral where you give somebody a map and you go off. It needs to be right on campus. San Antonio, mental health substance abuse is right on campus, right at our front door. Uh, places like Reno even have that. There are other places around the country that have sort of these type of things where you're all, all in one place. And so you got to get that to the place. So then you price out a new location and get it designed correctly. And so the first question is, does price help make you make that decision? You know, if, if this is, you know, X and this is 5X, you do X. Likewise, if that's X and that's 5X, you, you do that. So start by getting the real price of a real design. But what's happening now, people are starting in politics. People are like, I don't want you to do what I want you to do. If you start on the far right or far life, you're, you're not going to be like Washington, D.C. You're not going to get to a solution. Start with the core issues, work backwards, engineer it, price out two solutions. And then if they become even, then that's when I think you start asking agencies, what do you think is gonna work best? Because they're in the field. Police, fire, what do you think is gonna work best? Don't, and I'm a former politician, don't ask a politician. I mean, do not ask a politician. Ask somebody who really works in the real world of homelessness. And if you don't like me, there's guys like Sean Lee or other people around the country who do this, who's real smart about this. And you can do this in a very smart way. And I'll end with, you can be smart and you can still be compassionate. In fact, I would argue by being smarter, your compassion goes farther. If you are smart on your systems approach, you can help more people for the same dollar. I am the, and, and I got asked by one TV guy, I, I was really sort of surprised, I said, are you a passionate or you're not passionate? Everywhere you go, if you go to my campuses and places I've worked, you'll see homeless people who know me and come up and give me hugs and go, thank you for giving me, you know, here and there. You know, I want to increase graduation rates. I don't want to keep you in a park, and I don't want to arrest you. I want to have you in society and, and self-sustainable. That's my goal. And you can do that in a very smart way that's with dignity and respect. If you go to San Antonio, virtually every building we have, you'll see somewhere dignity and respect. Dignity and respect. We have that built in all through our campus. That's part of our culture training. Dignity and respect. Dignity and respect. And you want to do, you can do this with very smart love. And I think it actually goes further, not less. So with that, I'll just end and we'll just start QA. and I've got one minute to spare. So I, I finished at 8 o'clock. So. Okay. So, uh, uh, it, do you want me to just sort of pick pick a place and then I'll start working them down? So, start at the bottom. Yeah, uh, start at the bottom. This is the newest one right here. Okay. Okay. How many total homeless? Uh, our campus has about 22 to 2,300 people living on our campus at any one time. We have 2,100 people who have completely graduated from homelessness in San Antonio. Okay, what's the next question you want to hit? It maybe just blew them out. Yeah, um, let me just talk to you a second about youth homelessness. Is it different than the issue there? Yeah, um, and I didn't do this because in the long format I have a lot more of it. Unaccompanied minor, unaccompanied youth is a major, major problem. Part of that is because of the fostering out system. Part of that is because of runaways. Some of that is prostitution and drug. Uh, a lot of uh, drug people now have found you can hire homeless people to be your runners. 
and a homeless person takes it because it's quick money and it gives you some money. It's a horrible thing when you mix drugs and alcohol. Fresno right now has probably one of the worst programs in America where two of the big drug lords purposely, strategically hire homeless people to do their deliveries because if you get arrested, nobody cares and they don't have to bail you out. And so they're not part of your team, so they, and there's somebody else right behind to come in. That's a horrible predatorization. And so the youth are getting involved in that. The key on unaccompanied minor and youth, that even though you may be over 18, they should fall within the family and children system. The, the case management is really family. Again, churches doing fun rides. We had penny drives of kids. We had, we took money from the county, money from the city. We got money from the state. And it's interesting. Out of 125 million, guess how much money in the first three years we got from the federal government? Zero. Eventually, I think we got 380,000 to 500,000 from there. So if you're if you're going to wait around and think the feds are going to do it, so the answer is you need money from everybody. You need to raise. And here's the other thing: in every community I've gone to that has succeeded, money has never been the issue. And I've worked in poor communities in here, way poor. Money has never been the issue. The issue is getting agencies to work together or realizing you have a real problem or not working together. Those are what have killed things. Or ultimately NIMBYism. And you, and you get NIMBYism everywhere. So I don't even really worry about that because that, that's everywhere. Yeah, so, oh, she went and she had a... And, and also don't do five years of studies and yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. Hi, my name is Jean Corey and I'm with an organization called Utahns Against yes, Hunger. Okay, um, to what extent does your model engage the folks who are homeless in addressing and creating solutions for their problems and the barriers that they face? And also, to what extent do you engage in changing public policy that exacerbates the problem, specifically wage issues, transportation, housing, and public assistance. Yes, yes, and yes. But, but, and I don't mean to be facetious. If you don't try to make policy change while you're doing this, this is not about a box or a series of boxes. If you think that, this will never work. It has to be a systems policy across the board approach. Um, you absolutely have to have the homeless community bought in and working with you. Initially, there's a change is always scary for agencies for funders, for individuals, that, that will always, always happen. But you have to have homeless people part of it. And, and one of the best groups I ever have seen is Miami. Every dorm, every sort of unit of operation elects a mayor for a two week period. They used to elect a mayor and they found out they needed term limits. And that is serious, they literally had people trying to do it. And they found out it became a leadership position. It's many people who take the job almost like in a rotation transform and so the agency actually hosts the election for whatever the unit is and they have a leader for two weeks that you work with and they go to all the staff meetings they go to all the meetings they're part of the process um, when, you, when you form this group you want at least one homeless person on your group you, you, you want that so you got it you got to have that trying to hide my uh, so you advocated that um, these types of efforts should not be led by politicians or uh, business owners, but people have skin in the game. The Pioneer Park Coalition is headed by a former politician, and the main members are business owners in the area of Pioneer Park that are concerned about their businesses. Who do you think should be the head of our coalition based on that? And do you think those people should be the head of the coalition? The, the pr it, here's what I would do if I was running, if I was to form a group from scratch. I'd find the three or four biggest single givers of money in your community that do not live here, maybe not even have, where, where, they're from the community, they're within the community, 
but nobody's going to say you're on there because you got a building next to it. You know, so that you get deconflicted. But take the three or four elders of your community that everybody goes. If that person says we need to do this, I believe them because they've always made good decisions in the past. They care for our community. You should have one homeless person on that. I think you need to have a police or fire type of person on that. They're very critical. They are some of your best data resources. Then I'd say to the county mayor, the the I'd say to the the, the state government because it's, you got a unique relationship. The, the county government, city government. Each of you send us one person over each. Don't care who it is. You you let them be. It's somebody they trust. And if they pick a builder or a developer, tough luck. You know, or if they pick an agency, yeah, tough luck. But you let them pick who it is. And that gets you to about eight or nine people. Then I'd have your three core agencies be ex officio, not voting, but ex officio uh, 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 resource, like a resource person. And then you just get started. I, I went off. So. Okay. Yes, sir. What amount of geographical uh, space in San Antonio do you have for your program there? In San Antonio, we have 37 acres all in. Four acres are inside, and they're all contiguous, and they're inside the Central Business District. That's why I'm always shocked when people say you're trying to move people way out. Like, um, of the programs we've done, only two are away from the urban core. Most of the time, it's in the urban core from some, some logic. And I've published, you can go to a couple places, I've published a two-page listing of criteria you can follow that we know that works. Right, but, but remember you scale. We were in charge of dealing with 22 counties. We weren't in charge of, your problem is significantly smaller, and so you gotta scale your problem. The functionalities and the root causes are exactly the same, but your sizing and scaling need to be dropped dramatically. You already have them all. That's what, I mean, go from 4th Street up to the police station, that's your mall. I mean, right now, you got them all. you got a bunch of services already there. So the question is, can you fix that and make it functional to help graduation rates and reduce the impact of the local community? And then price that out. And then have it something to compare it against. Have this, but do it apple to apple. Don't play a game. Don't say, you got to rehab this and then, and then over here, you, you do a lower quality. Make it apple to apple functionality, apple to actual quality and then price out both sides and that will be a, the first decision you make. That may make your decision for you. If it doesn't, then you go deeper into the, the core. Yes, ma'am. How significant of it some of these other cities that you've worked with? What I've observed because I've been downtown for a long time. I have a business downtown and what I've observed is that population has changed dramatically, like you mentioned, with the aggressiveness. And when I was downtown and, and even working with the road some years ago, it was a much different population than it is now. So from my understanding and a lot of what I observe is this drug issue that we have going on has really escalated it and made it hard to separate. So the other cities that you've worked with, have they had those same dynamics with the drug issues? Absolutely, same issues. That you, you're not unique. I, I'm sorry to tell you, you're not unique. I mean, I have not heard a question or an issue in the last 36 hours that are not everybody else is experiencing. And I think the agitation or the aggressiveness I saw just for me personally at Christmas time that I have never seen before when I come to Utah almost every year, sometimes for days, weeks, months. I think there are two things going on. One is frustration. And, and, and that can be because you have a compactness going on, there's some things like that, without the right, fun, without the service levels, and there's definitely a frustration on it. And, then, and the other is, just jump right to the punchline, is spice. And what spice has done in the artificial synthetics, what that has done throughout the entire country in the last eight years, before they might have been on alcohol, and now they're on a synthetic. And so, um, but that's why you, the one advantage if you get organized and get structured, the, the, the you know, first thing I said in Fresno is you got to break away the drug lords. And, you know, Fresno had a very unique problem. I've never seen anything like that. And, you know, man, you got to drive, think about what you got. If you really are, you know, I'm kind of really going to get in trouble. Yeah, I'm 
two cameras going, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> what you really got going there is you have a unstrategically designed mall that is a series of things, and it goes from uh, 4th Street to the police station, and you have the drive-through drug center. You just literally get right up the freeway, and you drive through, and they're in the same place. They're co-mingled. If I, the first thing I would do, I'd block that street off. I mean, if, if you, because you can't solve everything immediately, but you start doing it, I'd block that street. I would cut it off the bottom and the top and stop that drive-through. Because that drive-through is exacerbating your problem. And what you're doing is you've got to co-mingle into two different issues. I'm not your best person on drugs. And, and I, I, have a, I have a master's degree in criminal justice. But I'm not the smartest guy in the drug world. you, you got to go to get somebody else. I am not your smartest guy in hunger. The best guy in that is Robert Eggert, who, who started DC Kitchen, LA Kitchen. He's written the great, if you ever want to read a book that understands my philosophy, it's a book, it's a quick read. It's called Begging for Change. And it's about how he transformed from giving food out to giving, to working with jobs and heroin. He works with the worst people in DC, and he created a heroin training recovery program that ends in a job training program of food that is employed by the people they give the food to. And that's what you do. But you've got to separate the drug problem from the homeless problem. You, I mean, you ergonomically got to do that immediately. I mean, you, we don't need to have a study group to tell us what should we do that. I mean, I'd block that road. I'd, if I were mayor for a tent, I'd put a barrier on both ends and said that street is forever blocked, period. And I don't know what the police think about it, but that, that's, that, you know. Back here. Okay. But I've stopped all the drive through traffic to that area. Well, yes. we, we did that last summer and it took a lot of heat. So now it is closed from 10 p.m. to about 5 a.m. If I had my way, if you got to let us do it, we would close that. But there is an impact um, to some of the business. No, and, and I get that, but, but if you get the other functionality fixed over time, maybe you reopen it and such. But I tell you, what, what you got now is not working. I mean, and you know what? Some of the solutions are going to be uncomfortable or scare certain people or change is scary. But if you don't do it, you're not going to, I mean, and, and, and likewise, it's okay to try some things and if they don't work, we tried a bunch of stuff in San Antonio that I thought were brilliant. It, it, you know, the staff came in and got, this is just not working. Shoot it. If it's not working, kids, you know, move it on. I mean, try something different. Um, you, you've got to keep working till you fix it. And, and your first, second, and third time sometimes won't work. But what I do know now is where you got your current mall is also probably your biggest drive through drug dealing place in the city. And I may be wrong about that, but they're co located on the same exact street. This is crazy. I mean, I know I'm just an outsider, but looking at that, that seems crazy to me. Robert, do you want to take a couple on the board there and then we'll get back to the audience? Okay. Um, I love this question here, the second one. Everybody can make a difference. Everybody can make a difference, but not everybody has to be the leader. And what I find in these homeless deals is everybody thinks they got to be the leader. You know what? I love that idea of the nine person group, especially if I'm on it. And if I'm not on it, I really don't like that nine person group. I mean, I, I get that a lot. And so, the youth in particular, that's how I started. I started out in youth. And so the big thing is to ask yourself, whatever you do, whatever your part of touch is, are you helping to engage homeless people into recovery or are you enabling things? Are you criminalizing it? Or are you enabling it or are you engaging in recovery? And ask that, and everywhere you go, ask that question. Um, and, and sometimes something that's currently enabling might become engaging later. Sometimes some things flip and become marketing. Next question. Up. Okay, and I'm looking at clock. We promised eight more minutes, or yeah, let's, or do you want to stop? The question, maybe, yeah, there, Summarize your recommendations, Salt Lake. Just start doing something smart. Get a smart group of small people. Start doing it, and, and that group should go on a road trip. That it, I would get those nine people, put them on a plane, I could point them to five or six places, go see places working. There's nothing you are experiencing that other cities have not already had. And there are a lot of people that have a strong learning curve that figured it out. And I don't mean they're perfect, I don't mean they're, they get to zero, 
but they got 80% success rates, which is way better than zero. And so I would get the right people and go around on a plane, and you can see some really good success, and then start pricing it out. Don't study it anymore. Yes, sir? How are you defining the success? A lot of these groups talk about building self-efficiency, but no one's defining the success. Yeah. To, to, to me, I define success. I have four measures, and they're pretty boring and simple. Uh, are you once you fit, graduate from a program one year out? Are you are you sustainable? And sustainable either means I have an economic job, I'm earning a living, and I'm paying my bills and, and doing that, or I'll go the extreme, a hundred percent disabled vet within their allotment of money they get from you know HUD and VA and all that. Are they in a sustainable living model? And I'm going extremes, and then there's some. You know, people mixed in the middle. But are you re getting the program or are you graduating self sustaining? That's number one. Jail, po jail population, how much of your jail population is homeless? The burden on emergency room, can you drop the ER and get the emergency department and what your street level? Because if you go to the intersection, I say count the number of people right now and then a year from the program, count the people. And that's, that's the measurement. I'm, I'm really simple. Um, but if you do those four, that means everything else you're doing either perfect or right or much better. Because if you continue what you're doing, none of those four needles are going to move. And so I look at those as outcome needles. And there's some sub measurements you can add and take away. But I look at very big picture stuff that that will tell you if you're moving big picture. Uh, new people that added had a question. I'm going to take one more. Off. Okay, take, um, uh, oh, oh, I, okay. I, I, um, I'm going to read the question. Yeah, then I'm going to do the question about graduating, recycling, recidivism. And, and, and this is going to take, and I'll to use this as the closeout, but it will teach you a little bit about our philosophy and how we do it. We were, and it's, it, and it's an absolute true story, when we were setting up Haven for Hope, we're trying to get a literature brochure about the literature like this. And so we wanted some success stories from our sister campuses. So we went to all our sister campuses, got in, you know, that we got to know as we helped develop and they helped design our campus. And we said, what are your successes? So send us a picture of a person, a little story in their blurb, and, and whatever. So that's what we did. And we got everybody in except for Miami. Miami, for some particular reason, wasn't sitting there as, and we really wanted to make because we had all these others. And we, I finally called up Miami and the head guy, uh, my counterpart, and I said, um, you've not given us the success. And they said, we're working on it, and we're trying to figure it out and get it, and it, we'll send it over this afternoon. So they sent it over, and it is a guy who went through their program 22 times. He failed. 22 times. Then he went in the program, got kicked out of the program, came back, and finally, on the 23rd time, he succeeded. And on this 23rd, he now comes back and teaches life skills classes actually at the campus. He is the general manager of one of the car auto, you know, the GM, you know, he, he's risen to general manager of one of the sections of this family car dealership. He makes about $85,000 base salary. He is drug free, clean, he recovered. And that's who they sent us as a success. And so we took that to my boss and my boss said, 22 times? That's not, and that was the whole blur was about how they never gave up on the person. And that was the message. And we adopted that as our philosophy. You never give up on anybody. You always, and you don't create artificial, you need, we give case manager guidelines, you know, X amount of time, X amount of days, but I'm very suspect when programs are so dogmatic and say, if you're not clean and sober when you come in, we can't find a place for you. Or if in 10 days you don't find a job, we're gonna kick you out. I'm suspect of those. You need guidelines and you need a case manager to customize that recovery for you or you, but don't have a one size fits all because everybody's triggers and situation are different. 
And so you need to allow, and any, anybody who knows anybody who's gone through treatment, any type of treatment of any type of program, recycling and recidivism is part of that. And so you need to build in and allow for that. But you also don't enable it, but you also don't give up on a person. And you got to keep getting people back into treatment if you want real recovery. So thank you very much. Appreciate you and have So Robert, thank you so much for coming to our city. Thank you for helping us to be edified. We don't know all the answers, but we do know one thing: we can make it better, and that's what our commitment is. A couple of house cleaning things. I want to thank Jonathan Harmon, our executive director. Please give him a round of applause. He, he is the king of this. I want to thank Mike Smith, who is uh, owns a, a technology company. He's here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Uday Techie, where's Uday? Uh, Uday, raise your hand. He's probably out there. Yeah, he's working. I want to thank him, but I want to mostly thank Dr. Marva for being here. Uh, Maria said, asked me, challenged me earlier, said, you don't tell us, it, and not that tone, you don't tell us when these meetings are. I am here to say Friday, June 5th at Spy Hop, 1145. Friday, June 5th, Spy Hop, 1145. Uh, please come and join us, and thanks to all the protesters who came in. We hope you've been edified. We are here. Uh, Dr. Marva will be here, and uh, we will answer any question you have. I also want to give a disclaimer that the uh, Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce is here. Uh, they are not endorsing this. Uh, Gail Miller, who owns this great facility, is the co-chair of the uh, commission. Uh, it doesn't mean because we held it here she's endorsing this. Uh, we go to different coalition members' uh, places. They want us to come there. They want us to see what happens in their neighborhood, and that's why Spy Hop would be the next one. So I want to give those disclaimers up front. But again, thank you, everyone, for your time, your energy, and most importantly, your love of our brothers and sisters. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.